So hi everyone and thank you so much to the organizers for having me at this conference. Um, I do feel a little bit like an imposter here as I'm not a video games researcher and my talk today is instead focused on a piece of literary fiction, Jennifer Egan's Black Box. However, this fiction, I think, um, is very relevant to the conference theme and it presents a very specific depiction of digital heroism. So I hope that you'll accept me. So Egan's Black Box, a Twitter fiction published in 2012, is, according to Amelia Precup, a spy thriller parody set in a near future, telling the story of a female citizen agent relying solely on the implants in her body and on her sexual appeal for the completion of her patriotic mission that involves gathering information from an enemy subject. And the text directly addresses the concept of heroism, stating that in the new heroism, the goal is to transcend individual life with its petty pains and loves in favor of the dazzling collective. So this quote is where the title for my paper came from, and it's of central importance to my argument as it defines heroism as a collective, not an individual journey, and as a rewriting of the human experience, viewing the everyday pains and loves of human existence as petty. And this heroism is inherently digital, as the path to becoming part of the Dazzling Collective involves abolishing the limitations of corporeality, to quote Catherine Hume on fantasy, through technological upgrades which embed surveillance equipment and weaponry within the central character's flesh body. So in my presentation, I'll first take you through the ways that I think we can view Black Box and its narrative structure through ideas of video games and game studies. And I'll then delve into the plot of the text and uncover what this new heroism means within the fictional world of Black Box, looking at embodiment, the digitization, and the gendered dynamic of this new heroism. And I'll finish by addressing how the format of the text and its unique style of publication contributes to these themes of a digital collective and of collective heroism. So first of all, how is J Jennifer Egan's Black Box like a video game? Well, the text details an undercover operative on a mission. And in this mission, there are rules to learn and to play by. And there's the constant threats of danger, death, and loss. And we learn these rules as the reader through the instructional formats of the text. The Twitter publication separates the text into short phrases, which are didactic in nature. And these instructions often relate to the usage of the technology that's implanted within the spy's body. And this technology is both her tools for collecting the information, which is the goal of her mission, and it's also her weaponry for self-defense. And we might think of this technology as the kit available to our character. This kit is revealed function by function and explained again in an instructional format. For example, these quotes on the side, activate the microphone by pressing the triangle of cartilage across your ear opening and pressing your left thumb, if right-handed, against your left middle fingertip begins recording. These lessons in how to use the kit are, I think, reminiscent of the introductory scenes of many video games, where the purpose is to acclimate the player to the rules of the game and the technical details of how to move and act. And the focus on hands in, the, in these quotes, using hands and fingers to manipulate the technology embedded under the agent's skin, further enforces this comparison because both keyboard and console-based gaming are mainly controlled by hand movements and finger dexterity. And this kit and the explanation of the many functions and actions available to the agent also creates a sense of false freedom or false autonomy. And Jan Simon states that the trick of the trade of game design is indeed to make the player <laughs> believe she is in control, which is often achieved in gaming through limited options such as dialogue trees, which enforce rules while enabling some decision on the part of the player. And in Black Box, the agent may appear in control, but for one, the story is already written and there's no option as to how it's going to end. And two, the functions are tied to very specific moments and times. The agent is less an autonomous individual than a programmed machine. More on that later. But the most interesting connection to game studies within Egan's text is, for me, the narrative structure of her text. Now, I don't want to get too far into the narratology versus ludology debate here, not being a game studies scholar myself, though I have elucidated the importance of rules within this story and my video game reading. 
But when I say narrative structure at the moment, I refer now to the style of the address and the narrative tense utilised by Egan. So Precup provides a really excellent overview of this, which I'll read. She says that Black Box reads like a mix between an instructions manual and a mission log, recited and recorded by the protagonist and meant to provide information on how to use one's body in order to complete a spy mission. The architecture of the text is based on effectively concise and well-balanced sentences, consisting mostly of a mix of conditionals, laying down procedural steps, directives and prescriptive statements, strings of corrective recommendations that acknowledge the fallibility of procedures and their impossibility to forecast all possible outcomes, guidelines for manipulation, dissimulation and seduction techniques, patriotic motivational slogans and terse observations with aphoristic inflections. So, Precap's overview details the informative, blunt, didactic form of the text. Each line written provides instruction. For example, the extract on the right-hand side there. <coughs> we move closer to the sketches you wish to photograph, allowing them to fill your field of vision. Hold, very still. A flash is more dramatic in total darkness. An epithet in another language followed by what the fuck was that, means that you overestimated your designated mate's handset absorption. A bright, throbbing, total blindness means that you neglected to cover your non-camera eye. So we can see here that the text is written in second person, centering the reader in the action and making the reader feel as if the instructions apply to them. <clears throat> And in this way, <coughs> sorry, the reader learns the rules of the game and feels the full weight of the dangers. This extract here reveals the very real physical consequences of any mistakes that are made. And yet this text is not actually directed at the reader because the reader stands in the position of another agent. The entire narrative of Black Box is a recording of the agent's thoughts, a recording that will serve as both a mission log and a guide for others undertaking this work. So this text is then an instruction manual based on past experience, a guide that will be passed on to the next agent, on to the next player in the game. And this notion of passing on guidance to future colleagues begins to introduce the collective nature of the heroism within this text. The narrative, the mission, the game, it doesn't just belong to the agents featured in this story, but to all the many agents who will play their part. And correspondingly, the glory of the achievements, achievements made is also collective. It belongs to all of those who played their part in the mission. And the narrative style of the text, again, has a huge role here because it never names the agent, but instead uses the second person of you. As I mentioned, this centers the reader and it draws them into the action but it also has the effect of uniting all past, present, and future agents under the collective address of you. And it's further significant that Egan doesn't name her character because she has, in interviews and statements made outside the world of Black Box, stated that the agent in this text is in fact an extension of a character from her 2010 novel, A Visit from the Goon Squad, a woman named Lulu. And this link impacts my reading of Black Box in a myriad of ways, but for my focus in this presentation, it's Egan's refusal to acknowledge who this character is within the text while having an answer ready that has the greatest impact. Because leaving the character unnamed reflects that this experience is not unique, and it acknowledges the multitude when it refers to the individual. And moving on a bit to the digital aspect of the heroism in this text, this choice expresses that the protagonist is not a unique case. She's not a freak accident like Frankenstein's creature, but that the bodily upgrading and the inter integration of technology into flesh that occurs within the text is an intentional, repeated, and shared experience. So let's look at that process of technologization, of becoming a digital hero, and ask what it demands from the agent. The main character in the story had her body technologically enhanced and transformed into a highly efficient tool for the purpose of gathering, storing, and transferring information. The agent essentially becomes a military tool. Her body is not her own property, even her thoughts are recorded as a missions log. 
Now, we don't see this process in the text, just the results. But we can imagine that having surveillance equipment embedded in your limbs, in your brain, in your eyes, requires a lot of painful surgery. So why go through this at all? The text reveals the motivation in its description of heroism, a kind of utopian digital collective. The Hiya, hiya, Mary. Sorry to, sorry to interject here. You're, the left um, there. Spoken like motivational statements. We make some or whatever to their equipment. Oh, no, I'm sorry about that. No, I'm no, not no. too sure what to do. No, 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 it's absolutely fine. Um, just as you switched over to this, um, this slide that you're on now, you really uh -huh. started to break up, but you're now absolutely fine. Would you like to go from where you were then? Um, you're absolutely yep. fine now. Right, okay. okay. Sorry about that. No worries. I was just reading out this quote that's on the left there anyway, so you can all see that. Um, so it's this repeated phrase of in the new heroism, talking about how ordinary people have the chance to glow in the cosmos of human achievement because of technology. And in this, these statements, we see that technology in the text is the pathway to glory because it allows ordinary people to become superhuman in their abilities and contribute to this collective effort. Now, here I'd like to bring Donna Haraway's comments on technologization and the cyborg into the picture. She says that communications technologies and biotechnologies are the crucial tools recrafting our bodies, that these tools embody and enforce new social relations for women worldwide. And commenting upon Haraway's work, Arthur Croker states that while others might conclude their studies of the very same history of technology, with more utopian aspirations for being digital, that Haraway proceeds to deepen the intersection of digital technology and laboring women's bodies into a grisly scenario involved with the informatics of domination as the newest recursive loop in hypercapitalist globalization. Now, this notion of technology recrafting the human, combined with the focus on female bodies and this informatics of domination that enforces gender roles and hierarchies, perfectly applies to the new heroism of Egan's text. You see, the text transforms beautiful, innocuous female bodies into spy weaponry. The agents are nicknamed beauties because their cover is being a vain, vacuous state to a powerful man, their target. And this previous manifesto of the new heroism thus not only implies that female bodies are essentially useless without technological upgrading, it also removes all individuality and all individual power from these women, marking them as a collective, as mass-produced weapons which are wielded by those in charge. And the text's promise of a collective heroism extends beyond the agent's active service, offering a new understanding of death and the afterlife. Death, the only guarantee in human life, is rewritten. It is no longer the end of all existence, as the collective data remains. Remember that, should you die, your field instructions will provide a record of your mission and lessons for those who follow. Remember that, should you die, you will have triumphed merely by delivering your physical person into our hands. Death is reframed as a success story, reminding the agent that her body and her consciousness are of secondary importance to the data that she must collect on her mission. So the human body, the beauty, is merely attractive, disposable packaging. Again, individuality is removed, as all agents their lives, their unique experiences and bodies are erased and they become collective, homogenous data points. And even beyond death, this digitization extends to a new kind of afterlife. Egan writes in this second extract, some citizen agents have chosen not to return. They have left their bodies behind and now they shimmer sublimely in the heavens. In the new heroism, the goal is to transcend individual life with its petty pains and loves in favor of the dazzling collective. You may picture the pulsing stars 
as the heroic spirits of former aging beauties. You may imagine heaven as a vast screen crowded with their dots of light. And this statement describes the ultimate transition from human flesh to disembodied cognition, made possible through the agent's unique physicality. But this also completely disrupts the traditional human chronology, as living forever as a technological signifier provides eternal permanence in a way that the human body can't sustain. And this collective there highlights all other agents who have also given their lives over to technology for the sake of this mission. And the third statement in this extract, which echoes the language of the new heroism manifesto, reminds the agents that their petty individual lives are to be sacrificed to this collective. The agents are thus consoled by their digital legacy, encouraged to find peace in this digital cosmos that they will add one dot of light to. To link back to my thoughts about video game parallel, I think each dot of light here, which represents a completed mission saved permanently on a digital server, is much like levels of a game that can be revisited once the central mission is accomplished. Our agent has completed her game and her heroic journey is saved for all the future players to learn from. The computer screen then becomes a digital graveyard. And this breaking of embodied limitations and rewriting of legacy and afterlife is mirrored in the text's publication style. As I mentioned, this text was published via Twitter and it was disseminated by the New Yorker's Twitter account in 140 character tweets, one released per minute for one hour a day over 10 days. And this means that the original reader's encounter with this text was entirely characterized and mediated by technology, discovered on a device, read on the screen piece by piece, and it had to slot into the mess of news updates, personal stories, and memes that is the Twitter home feed. And this broken form of tweeting the text piece by piece mimics the patterns of the agent's thoughts being recorded and up uploaded to the system. So the way that we read the text is exactly how these thoughts will be read in the case of her demise and the opening of the black box. Additionally, the unretractable nature of anything posted online guarantees digital immortality in the same manner that's promised within the text itself, living on forever as a collection of digital data points. Online archives, retweets, and screenshots all promise the same kind of preservation. So this dislocated publication method means that the text itself becomes part of a larger story, merging with other narratives and losing its own material borders, not existing as a traditional, tangible paper book. And in this sense, Black Box loses its individual structure as a unified piece of fiction, and itself becomes part of the dazzling digital collective. Here are my references. Thank you so much, Mary. I think I speak for everyone by saying that um, you're very much at home here. Um, that's a fascinating um, presentation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, we're now going to move on to um, David Kosick. Um, David Kosick's paper uh, is called, Well, Excuse Me, Princess, Designed Identity and Gendered Heroism in Nintendo Switch Advertising. Uh, are you around, David? Yes. I ah, brilliant. Seven. Yeah, no problem at all. Um, so David Kosick is a first year PhD student in the media, cinema and digital studies um, department in the English department at University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. He holds a BA in English education from University of Wisconsin, Eau and an MA in media studies from University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. His research focuses on the political, social and discursive power of video games, video game fan cultures, particularly queer fandoms and fan games. Kosick also researches the portrayals of governmental power in video games and video game regulation, and he is going to present his paper, well, excuse me, princess, 
designed identity and gendered heroism in the Nintendo Switch advertising. Okay, David, are you ready? Hear me? Yep. Okay, perfect. Um, so, um, thank you so much for having me and for letting me present this work. Um, if you don't know what my reference in the title is, um, it is a classic line from the long ago Legend of Zelda um, TV show, and look up that on that line on YouTube to your own dismay. Um, so what Star I'm going to be talking about today is the um, Nintendo Switch advertisements um, that specifically oh. cover um, no. a number of games. Oh. These were ads that were introducing I'm pretty sure, the console. I think, um, I think Han Solo says public, it's a I'm looking specifically at ads Hope. that are accessible from the United States and were used to advertise over here where I'm from. Yeah. And so what I'm going to talk about um, with oh, yeah, this That's particular... Perfect memes. Um, I'm going to talk about the fantasy genre and masculinity, um, and then go into some discussions about design identity and techno masculinity, and then we'll go into Nintendo Switch ads and how the ads for the Switch are different yet also strikingly similar to previous ad campaigns and how they talk about and show gender in their advertising. So, just a very quick um, base. Um, in terms of gender discourses that I'll be referencing throughout. Um, Angela Goddard um, made this really easy to follow list of traits that are um, within gender discourse that are seen as kind of directly oppositional, oppositional from one another um, in terms of relationships, um, media consumption, et cetera, et cetera, in all walks of life. And um, as video game uh discourses developed they also followed along with these lines of gender discourses as well um along the masculine line so um we're looking particularly at um how video games have started to become associated with the masculinized discourses of rationality um logic being aggressive being competitive being strategic etc and how it kind of um went away from the feminized discourse or tries to um, distance itself from it, but such as being empathic, emotional, submissive, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when, when video games um, started utilizing these discourses, um, which I'll get to in a second, it did so kind of unilaterally. But as Nintendo Switch uh, approached and there was a new advertising campaign, the relationship between fantasy and masculinity was kind of solidified. So before I talk about actual video games, I just want to talk a bit about gender and fantasy and kind of some research about that area. So there is surprisingly not a lot, and maybe I was just entering the wrong search terms, but the, I didn't find a lot of information about masculinity and traditional um, books and movies uh, uh, within the fantasy realm. But I did find a couple about Lord of the Rings and also The Inheritance Cycle, which is um, the book Aragon and its sequels. And um, within these three articles by Chance Evans and Ruiz, they each talk about how fantasy genre in general has a tenuous relationship with masculinity and the masculine discourse that I mentioned previously. And these titles often show how failures within the world of the of the book often come about because of masculine heroism because people are too competitive aggressive apt to you know war taking over other people etc cetera, etc cetera. and often the heroes that we have in these novels kind of transcend the masculinized discourse and become a hero by somewhat rejecting being just a masculine figure. And this is often done through rejection of stoicism, where they have to kind of encounter their own emotions in order to proceed throughout the novel and develop as a character. And we also see a little bit of a rejection of the of rugged individualism as well. Moving into games then, it's like books, there aren't a whole lot of um, research articles directly about masculinity in games. But I did find an article by Tyson Pugh about queerness within the Legend of Zelda series that I found to be interesting and very similar to Lord of the Rings and Inheritance Cycle um, 
previously mentioned, all that work, the fantasy genre within The Legend of Zelda operates in a way that is somewhat queer and is somewhat kind of destabilizing the strict masculine feminine binaries. Um, and often it does throw through using um, kind of typical fantasy iconography. So that means including fairies as a very big um, uh, motif kind of throughout the series, including characters like Tingle, um, which are very coded in queer ways, and also including a child mythical hero um, in Link, in which the heterosexual climax of the story in which you reunite with Zelda is always just beyond the grasp of the player, right? You complete the game um, and you reunite with Zelda, but there's no way you can actually play within the game where you are directly connected to her. You see the ending, but then as soon as you end, it takes you back to the point right before the ending. So that heterosexual climax isn't always necessarily there. And so in these ways, fantasy and video games kind of allow for slippages within that heterosexual matrix of masculine feminine discourses. But unfortunately, within video game development, we see a lot of entrenchment within those discourses, where game designers and game advertisers still use masculinized and feminized discourses and ideology within their games, despite the fact that there is that potential for um, kind of a blurring of masculine and feminine. So. Uh, in Shira Chess's book, Ready Player Two, which is fantastic, um, if you haven't read it, and you're interested at all about um, game advertising, but also um, masculinity and, and gender, um, she coins this term designed identity, and she views it as this mix of industry conventions, textual constructs, and then audience placements in the design and structure of video games. So she goes very in depth with um, particularly mobile games like Farmville or um, Diner Dash or things like that, in which they're kind of designed with this idea of a feminine player. And it's very stereotypically designed around the feminized discourse. So it's all about regulating other people's emotions. It's all about, you know, constantly working to make sure everyone is taken care of or satisfied. Um, and so what Sheer Chess argues, and which I somewhat see reflecting in the Nintendo Switch advertising, is that the designed identities of players um, really goes along gender discourses in particular in terms of what video games are advertised to what people and who is seen as the primary audience versus the secondary audience, who is seen as the main core demographic versus the ancillary demographic, which no surprise because we live in the world we know, men are considered the default, whereas women are um, considered to be secondary. Unless you're making a very stereotypically feminine game, of course, like the ones I described before. And what I see happening in terms of the designed identity within mm -hmm. Nintendo Switch advertising has a lot to do with techno masculinity, which um, Carly Kokorek, she doesn't coin the term, but she kind of describes it in depth in a way that I really enjoy in her book, Coin Operated Americans, where she describes how, all right, so we have this designed identity where men are the primary, um, primary goal of the video game audience. How did that come to be, right? It didn't just come out of nowhere that men became the primary demographic. So in the United States, which is the context of the book, um, there is a very large um, kind of coalition of a bunch of historical and social factors that led to people being concerned about men, particularly boys, and their place in a developing economy where traditional jobs like in a factory were becoming less and information jobs um, were kind of becoming more prominent as computers became popular um, in terms of work. And also you have the video game arcade coming up and developing and kind of exposing all of these tensions that people are feeling about um, boys place in American economies. So it's kind of a calculated effort between video game developers, game lobbyists, and um, a variety of groups that kind of positioned 
video games and particularly the arcade as a site where boys can practice skills necessary for the workplace. So that would include um, developing skills like computer literacy, a military eye, um, being competitive, being intelligent, um, getting creative with problem solving, et cetera, et cetera. So basically there was this long kind of discourse being developed throughout the 70s and the 80s that then established video games as a masculine domain and particularly with this techno masculine ideal where it's not so much about being physically strong or being emotionally strong and not showing that emotion it's more about developing tech skills and so when it's applied to games then we see it explicitly when a game shows men using tech especially in manipulation of their physical environment which then relates to the legend of zelda and nintendo switch advertising so i know i'm going through a lot but with all of that behind us um basically when we look at nintendo switch ads then it follows that thread of techno masculinity and and, and like having men as the primary audience of video games for a long time and therefore ads and games are being designed for that male audience so with Nintendo Switch advertisements, there's a fantastic article by Amanda Coate, which talks about um, Nintendo Power Magazine. And in that magazine, uh, pretty much across the board, it would show men players and characters in agentic positions where they would be playing the games, um, you know, crossing dangerous rivers, you know, doing actions. Whereas the women in the magazine, especially in the 1990s, were stationary, were there just watching men play, or if there was a woman character, they're often waiting to be saved, such as this um, cover of Nintendo Power that features Zelda 2. So with the Nintendo Switch, moving to the second point, it's kind of going beyond that. And it's, it's a process that occurred throughout the 2000s um, to today, where women are becoming more of a demographic, and that's appearing in ads as well. Um, and when we get to Nintendo Switch, we actually see with the very first ads that they produce, so one ad in late 2016 and then one ad for the Super Bowl, you have women playing all genres of games, not just casual games, not just the feminized games that Shira Chess talks about where there are mobile games, but all kinds of games from party games to esports. But of course, there's a caveat, um, which we'll get to in a second. But I just... Uh, took mm -hmm. some screenshots from some of these ads to show you what this looks like. So um, in this image, um, the woman who's playing the Switch on the right is kind of the protagonist of the commercial for about 30 seconds, where she's playing her game inside her apartment, and then her friends invite her across the way, and then she goes and plays games with them. So you see her playing single player as well as party games. You also see women playing games on a competitive level so um, you see a sports esports team with two women on it competing and strategizing how they're going to win a game of splatoon 2. Um, and then in the super bowl ad you also see women playing within a variety of environments and with a variety of people so it's not just women or just men playing games but they're playing together and they're playing the same game together and what's really weird i shouldn't say weird what's interesting about the super bowl ad is that every time we see a woman and a man playing a game and facing off against each other a woman wins so this is really diverting from mm -hmm. women being only you know uh only passers-by or only viewers of the action and now you're seeing that nintendo is trying to at least within the u.s context incorporate women actually playing a variety of games within their advertisements so that also reflects then that the designed identity most likely is moving beyond just a male demographic and is slowly transitioning to include more of a female audience as well but uh unfortunately or however you want to phrase it the legend of zelda breath of the wild which is kind of the main selling point of the nintendo switch is still holding on to the masculinized discourse of video game players it's the only game that shows almost exclusively men playing it and it's always shown playing it 
the person who's playing it, who's a man in this case, is always playing it by themselves with almost nobody watching. And so this is more so taking up the mantle of the game advertisements of the past, as well as using some of the masculinized discourses um, of like individuality and um, uh, kind of the individual spirit, problem solving, et cetera, et cetera. So what you see in these ads then is that the, the Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild is kind of the last gatekeeping um, point for games. And the, the fact that it's a fantasy genre is part of the reason why it's the solely gatekeeping point, which I'll talk about um, when I show some screenshots from these advertisements. So with The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, what you see is that the techno-masculine is very apparent within the game realm. You have a mixture of the natural environment and then also high-tech um, things such as these high-tech shrines, as you can see in this photo, but there's also dangerous robots um, and high-tech equipment like ancient bows you can use um, that utilize technology. So you kind of have in the game itself a mishmash of techno, right, being able to manipulate um, tech and also create a problem solving to solve problems and then also the traditional masculine of dominating the environment so then that also bleeds into the actual advertising for the game as well so within the first look at nintendo switch ad right we have those sections where women were playing games together or with other men or competing in the sports setting but the video starts with one man playing the Breath of the Wild game, which is the you know game that's the main selling point of the title. And we see him playing it within his bedroom. And then we also see him going out into the natural world here, a park, um, to play the game as well. So it not only highlights the mobility of the system, but it also shows how the game itself also echoes that mix between the high tech of the home and then also the exploration of the natural world. And it's a motif that happens repeatedly throughout these game, uh, game advertisements, I should say. There's also a part where a man is playing the Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, um, and then eventually Skyrim. But in this section, he's playing Breath of the Wild. And much like the Nintendo Power ads um, before, it's an example where he is showing the woman in the ad the game and she's like all excited and it looks like she's never seen it before even it's, though it's the highest selling and most popular title at one of the most popular series in the world um we see that that idea of women as passive uh, as consumers of other men playing the game right just watching them play it um is still something that's being held up with legend of zelda breath of the wild we also see in the nintendo switch super bowl commercial um where again men and women were playing games all together in the very beginning just like the previous ad it starts with a man playing legend of zelda breath of the wild and of course the very first image we see of the game is of link um, defending zelda who's playing the damsel in distress within this moment of the game and he's defending her because he's the big strong burly man so you still even though it's within this ad that's showing women and men playing games in a variety of different environments, we still have Breath of the Wild um, being advertised solely as a masculine game. So what does that have to do with fantasy and why does that matter? Oh, here are also just a couple of little um, interesting add-ons too. There's also a strange push um, towards men um, who have kids to play it, which I guess makes sense because they're targeting a different audience. But there are a couple ads that show fathers playing The Legend of Zelda as well, such as in this example here where a man is literally like uh, having his baby rest in a baby Bjorn while he plays. So for the conclusion then, what's interesting about these ads is that it's it's so consistent throughout them. And I have all of them linked in the... In the um, in this presentation if you want to look at all of them it's so consistent that women are shown playing all types of games except for those in the fantasy genre particularly breath of the wild so bringing it all back together with the um, potential you know uh, troubling 
of the masculine and, and feminine discourses within the fantasy genre, part of what the Switch might be doing then is it's using this techno-masculinity of being skilled in the environment um, in terms of being intelligent, creative, problem-solving, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, might actually be used to flatten the potentially queer and radical feminist mm -hmm. potentials of the fantasy genre and medium. And it seems to me to be a very strategic effort towards coding that particular genre as still the masculine domain. Um, for example, we have in another ad, John Cena playing Breath of the Wild. So I'm not too sure. Um, that's kind of like a forward projecting idea that I'm interested in, in looking at further. But I, I think there's a connection between <clears throat> the fantasy genre, but then also the advertising having to kind of make it heterosexual and straight and male because it has such queer potential um, is something that I'm interested in looking at in the future. Thank you. Those are my work side. Thank you very much, David. Um, an excellent um, presentation. Thank you so much. Are you still live? Yes, I can turn off. If that's all right. Thank you so much. That would be, um, yep. Brilliant. And now for our final paper of the day. Um, last but certainly not least is um, Anna Gabriela Mendez Gutierrez. Um, and Anna's paper is called To Shine by Its Own Merit, Indigenous Representation in Malacca. Did I pronounce that right? Malacca? That is correct. That's how you pronounce it. Brilliant. Uh, okay. Um, Anna, um, eager dreamer and professional bookworm, she graduated with a BA in literature from the Universidad de Monterrey, completed an MLIT in comparative literature at the University of Glasgow, and a master's degree in books and literature for children and young people from the Universitat uh, Autom Autonoma de Barcelona. Um, she has published short stories and hopefully one day will actually finish longer ones. Uh, fascinated by adaptations, transmedia storytelling and fan culture, she is currently employed as a remote educational entertainer, aka a high school teacher via Zoom. She refuses to die before the Mexican football team wins the World Cup. So it's immortality for Anna. <laughs> Hopefully, Hopefully not. <laughs> Hopefully not. Um, and she is now going to present her paper. Uh, thank you very much, Anna. Thank you. Okay, so this is my paper, or well, the, the general idea behind it. So it has to do with indigenous representation in the video game Mulaka, which is a Mexican video game, an indie one, so you might have not heard from it, but you will hear a lot now. So. To get us started, let's talk a little bit about representation. So right now you should be groaning at the picture of Johnny Depp in the Long Ranger on your screen. If not, shout at me because you're not seeing the presentation. So uh, as we know, racial stereotypes in the media, they influence our interpretations, not only of the content in the media, but also in what we think of the people whose uh, racial myths we are perpetrating through these, uh, these stories, either they can either be in books, they can be in movies, they can be video games. So when we're talking uh, for this game, I'm going to talk about racial stereotypes and representation, but also a little bit about historical representation. So by now, we know that there are many ways that we can engage with history. And video games is one of the most popular ones at the moment. Uh, we were uh, talking about this in one of the break rooms. It's also one of the ways in which many people find it easier to engage and really get into it to, instead of just listening to a lecture or just reading a book. And in this particular case, we're gonna be talking about a mythological or idyllic past. So it's not, a, not exactly about historical accuracy, but more about what kind of engagement we are working with. It means what are, what did the people who made this game were thinking about? Did they want to just check a diversity box? Were they part of a tourist employee to get people to come over? Or is this a pedagogical tool 
these sort of educational games which get you real bored from the start because you know there's a lesson behind it, so you don't want to do homework at the moment. Instead, I'm going to argue and I'm going to try to show you that the people who worked in this game, they try to make it fun. That was their end goal. They wanted to make a game that was fun to play, although for this to work, they had to do it in a responsible way. Because we know there have been previous indigenous representation in video games. You have, for example, the infamous Oregon Trail, who has come, well, it has come under a lot of scrutiny regarding this particular issue. You also have Assassin's Creed 3, who had a um, part British, part, let me just check, Mohawk um, protagonist. So that's not nothing. You can still work on it, but at least they hired a consultant. So they were very concerned about these, not only issues about being true to life, but also about being respectful. And they ended up uh, taking into account some of the comments about um, the use and representation of ceremonial masks or this thing about trademarking the name of the protagonist. So his name is Connor and something else which I'm not going to attempt to pronounce, but it's there. And then you also have this uh, other example, Never Alone. So this game was created by the Inuit community. They worked with a lot of the elders in the community. They, they were actually very, not only thoughtful about the community, the game, you could say that the community itself worked into making this game a reality. So it wasn't something that people from the outside came over and wanted to work with. It's something that was born out of the same people who ended up seeing this project through till the very end. So what happens when it comes to indigenous people from Mexico? Usually in media at large, you get either something like this in Apocalypto, which is, I would like to say it's a trigger happy depiction of Mayans, even though there are no firearms in this movie. Or then you could also have things like uh, what you see on the right. So this is a poster from a very famous Mexican movie. It's called Macario. And this is a very romantic view of indigenous people, how they are poor in money, but also very pure of heart, mm -hmm. things like that. And when it comes to video mm -hmm. games, in the particular case of these indigenous uh, ethnic groups, you have the Aztecs that you can find in Medieval 2 or Age of Empires. Again, working with this idea of bloodthirsty conquistadors, well, bloodthirsty Indians versus conquistadors. To be fair, they were pretty bloodthirsty, so I'm not going to deny that. And then you also have these uh, exotic depictions of Mayans in this case. Although we should note, note that Mayans also lived in Central America, not just in Mexico. So what happens is that nowadays, uh, if you look into this kind of indigenous representation, you tend to see either uh, one of these two major uh, civilizations, the Aztecs or the Mayans, which is a shame because they are, I'm not going to say not very well represented, but they could be much more exploited and then again, you have the fact that nowadays, today, in Mexico, there are 68 different ethnic groups. You, well, we measure that in terms of who has a language of their own with its own mythology and these kinds of things. So in the case of uh, Mulaca, it's based in the Tarahumara people, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit more. So for now, I'll just introduce you to the studio who made this happen. So the studio name is Lienzo, which means canvas in Spanish. They are a small, a very small uh, studio based in the city of Chihuahua. And they worked in this game, Bulaca. Uh, define, they define it as a 3D action adventure game based on the rich indigenous culture of the Tarahumara. It's rated T, it's not a very long game. It's around five hours of play. It was released in 2018 and it's remarkable because it became the first Mexican game to be available in all the consoles of the same generation. Either you have Switch, you have it on Steam, you have it in the Xbox One, PS4, and soon there should be a physical release as well. So now I'm going to tempt the technology gods and show you a short video about this um, 
this game because I know that many of you probably haven't heard about it before. So let me just share my screen. In theory, I should be able to get the link. With that. Can you still hear me? Yep, yep, absolutely fine. We can't see anything at the moment, though. Yeah, that's what I'm seeing right now, that there's no share screen Get the video situation. Mm. Mm. So it's a shame. OK. I want to see how I can get back to the presentation. Mm. Mm. Turn on my camera. Go back. Oh, I shouldn't have tempted the technological gods. <laughs> there's no <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I'm gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna leave and come back. Be right back with you. See you soon. Uh, it's something to do with a uh, video. It's okay. okay. I am back. I'm back and yes, we're back on track. So we're sticking <laughs> to the PowerPoint. There you go. So this is uh, and like broadly speaking, the technical aspects of the game. It received good reviews overall. It's not considered like a perfect game or particularly groundbreaking in terms of storytelling or their me its mechanics. But you can see it's pretty well, uh, well reviewed. It's been the words Mexican cell that have been thrown around. So to get you in context, uh, we're gonna be talking about Mexico, especially the state of Chihuahua. Yes, Chihuahua like the dog. But despite what the tourism board would like you to believe, that breed is not from around here, it's from south, farther south. So within the state of Chihuahua, which is the biggest one in the Mexican Republic, it, can, it actually can fit all of the island of Britain. So that gives you an idea of size. So you have a lot of desert in the north, in that yellow area that you can see over there. But you have the Sierra Taromara, which is the green bit. And that one is very different. It has a lot of canyons, it has a lot of vegetation. So you can see both of those regions depicted in the game. Now, in order to start working with this, the team from Lienzo, they went over to the Sierra Taromara, they talked with the people over there. They were not exactly asking for permission, but in a way they were, first of all, trying to get them to understand what they wanted to do. And once the, the people around there understood the idea of the video game, particularly those uh, elders who had not been outside of the Sierra much, because most of the young population, they go out to the city in order to get education or to get a job. So they were more familiar with these concepts. And when they were talking with them, they found that the people were actually pretty excited about, about the whole thing. Uh, one of the, the leaders in that community, uh, governess, she said that she was all for it because they needed things to get the new generations to appreciate their culture because many of them are forgetting their language. They learn Spanish at school or at work and they, they don't care anymore about their traditional stories or anything like that. So uh, another way that they wanted to give back to the community, you know, not only going back to get their approval as, as long as the game was, or well, while the game was progressing, the design and everything, they have also pledged to donate some of their profits back to the communities in order to help them. So these people, they, they are also known as Raramuri or Taramara. Their name means light feet. So they are very well known because they run a lot. And they have won a lot of races abroad. So for example, the girl that you can see over there, her name is Lorena Ramirez. She won the Ultra Trail Cerro Rojo Marathon in well, Ultra Marathon in Spain, where mm -hmm. running with those sandals that you see over there. So when they ask her if she wants to don one of the fancy sports shoes they give her, she says that what's the point? Because all the people who wear those are running behind her. So and then on the other hand, you have uh, Martin Makawi. So he's a well-known poet and musician. Uh, the Raramuri people are known also for their dances, ceremonial dances, and of course the music that goes along with it. And he was actually the one who provided the voice for the narration at the beginning and end of the game in the cinematic um, sequences. So uh, you also have the... Mm, these are the, the people that the story is based around. And you can see how they have influenced the design in the game. 
So you see not only their faces, you see also their clothes, although they have been inspired by the more ancient depictions of them. You can also see, for example, this vase around. It's a very famous um, craft around here. These vases are very expensive, so we do not go around smashing them, although they do <laughs> contain some hidden goods in the game. And you can also see how the low poly style helped uh, with this idea of design because they're designing the clothes or in their crafts, they tend to have these sharp angles. So you can see that reflected as well, maybe not quite on purpose, but it helps with the illusion. And even the animals that you can find not only around in the landscape, but the ones that you fight with or against with, they, they can be found in real life. I know that those, uh, Carrots or macaws, I believe they are called. You will not expect to find them in the desert, but we have archaeological evidence that at some point there was a trade route that allowed them to be brought over. So, in terms of game mechanics, you have a very interesting thing around here. So, for example, to start with, you have unlimited stamina, because, again, these people are known for being very, very good runners. Then you also have, uh, if you can see over in the top right corner, we have three lives or three souls, because in their mythology, men have three souls and women have four. Unfortunately, here we can only play as a man, so we only have three souls to go with. You also have all these uh, power potions, and the way you get them is by harvesting all the plants around you, and they're all local plants. So you have aloe, chia, you have laurel, and maize. And then there's also the fact that this particular character is a uh, sukurwame, which is a kind of shaman. That means that he gets to uh, have this sukurwame vision, which allows you to talk to spirits, to see other things. And the currency system within the game, over here, it, I don't know if you can read it, it says korimas. So it's called korima, which is a concept uh, from the Taromara people that has to do with this idea that we should all share the resources. So if today I have more than enough and you're lacking something, you can ask for Gonima and I will give, give it to you because I know that tomorrow if you have more and I need something, then you're going to give it back to me in that way. So that's one of the way, ways in which they also started to incorporate this mythology or these ideals. Another way, I already mentioned the landscapes. This, for example, it's the very important waterfall, Vasasiachi. And you can see how the game is very, very, very closely designed to look like the real thing. And this also helps people who, maybe if you come from outside, this seems like a fantasy world and it's very pretty and that's it. But for the people who know it, they can think back of the places they've been to. The, they can also think back of this sort of idyllic past. So for example, Pakime, it's a, it used to be a big city in ancient times. Nowadays, it's in ruins. So it's not like the other pyramids that you can go to in southern Mexico, where you can still see them standing. Like, it may is not the case. But through this game, you have this virtual reconstruction, so you can feel a source of pride. Like, oh, look, I also had big, impressive cities. And maybe you can also jump around a little bit, like in Assassin's Creed. So this is a, a, a concept or an idea that helps you to go back, not only to this idyllic past before uh, there were any Spanish people coming over, but maybe a more recent past where you would be able to go to these places before, like a decade ago, we had a lot of problems with drug cartels. So many people miss those days when they could go to the Sierra without it, having to worry about that sort of thing. And when it comes to mythology, they work with this book, the Aniruame, which is written by a very famous anthropologist, Enrique Servin. So he compiled a lot of these myths, which are usually part of an oral tradition that you don't get to find in written stories a lot. So part of this oral tradition has to do with the fact that the Tarumara people are sons of stars, that they brought their world to life by dancing. So in the game, you also bring back your life by dancing. And in this sense, the, the team had to be a little bit creative because there's not a protagonist of this myth. It's, it's, there's not like a linear story. So they had to come up with um, more like a hero's journey type of story to fit the game and their narrative. So then in this game, you have, well, in mythology in general, there are many iterations of the world. And in this case, we have um, to convince the demigods that we are good people, that there are good people in the world, and we should continue to exist. 
So through this journey, you will uh, find a lot of mythological creatures. So you have stone monsters like the Gano or the Ganoko. You have these mantis people, which are based of the, the Pewanes, <laughs> another ethnic group that live in the north. And since it was a very strong oral tradition and we had no um, graphic depictions, it was a challenge for the team as well, because here, for example, you have this uh, Rusiwali, which is supposed to be a stone with teeth that sucks souls. And overall, as you can see, there's a lot of the nature element uh, pervasive in the story. So Mulaka is also the name of the protagonist. We already said he's a Sukuruame, so he's a shaman. But in order to be to have these powers, he has to be in very good terms with nature. So for example, he goes looking out for the help of these demigods, a snake, a bear, a deer. These are all animals that live in the Sierra and are sacred to the people over there. And this is where you start to get into the tricky questions because could this be an iteration of the mystical native trope? And I would argue that at this point, it might lean more towards a chosen one um, a narrative because the figure of the Sukuruame has been demonized by a, a lot of the missionary priests that came over. So this is a way to get back that narrative, get back that figure and say, no, you know what, this is a cool thing. So yes, I, I want to be a Sukuruame. And in this game, it's not like he's the only one who has powers, but more like he's the only one of his people who has the powers at the moment, but anyone else could also be like him if they wish to. You could also argue that it might fall into a stereotype, but I would say that in this case, we're working more with an archetype, this uh, hero archetype with its own cultural traits, which is something that in this particular case hadn't been done before with this particular culture. And when it comes to romanticization here, I will have to admit that towards the end of the game, there is a little bit of this, particularly in the conclusion when we talk about how he's very pure of heart and all of his people are like that. So it does feel a little bit like that, especially because there are no other, um, not, not white people or no other ethnic groups that you could compare them to, it's just them. So you have to rely on their word that, oh yeah, you're, you're the best of them. Still, uh, I think that's a good thing in a way, because we know how stereotypes can shape the way we think about people or the way we think about ourselves. So in this particular case, you have some people, you have children who are not used to seeing themselves in that kind of role as a hero. So this is a good thing for them and for others to see them as potential heroes. So this is why I think that this is an interesting case of representation. It's done in a very well thought of manner. You can still work on some issues, but still, overall, it's a very good example of how empowering it can be. Not only to see yourself out there, but know that others are seeing you and are very enthusiastic about your role in this particular narrative. So, in a way, going back to the stars uh, um, met metaphor, we could argue that there are thousands of myths hidden in the stars or in the world in general. And even if your particular brand of myths or culture feels a little bit neglected compared to brighter constellations like Greek mythology or things like that, they are still part of the heavens and they have their own merit because their light or their legacy has endured thousands of years to still be able to be heard today. So again, I think that by in itself, it's a way to to ensure that you deserve to shine by your own merit. To not compare yourself to other people or believe yourself and your culture compared to others, but to think like, you know what? Yes, I can be like this. I can get myself out there and people will play and have a good time. Because as we've come to realize today, I think, heroes do come in all shapes and sizes. We just gotta believe in them. So that's it from me. Thank you. Here's a little bit of the references in bibliography, although I have more if you want. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, superb. So we're going to have a slightly longer question and answer session now with our three um, panelists because there's three of them, but also they didn't benefit from having a breakout group. So this might spill um, into the conclusion time, but that's absolutely fine. Um, so a big round of applause. Um, I hope everyone's um, clapping away in emotes or otherwise. Um, let's go to our questions. Um, so I've got a question here from Ren. Um, 
Uh, this is a question for you, Mary. Um, I'm very curious about this notion of an embedded tutorial within the rhetoric of black box. Seemingly then, the pressing of buttons on the cybernetic body is metaphorically the collapse of the controller into the player. Or perhaps it's more honest to suggest that the cybernetic body is simply the controller to some other entity's game. This is becoming less of a game and more of a statement, but I'm curious of your thoughts on the hardware related metaphor. Yeah, um, definitely. So I just um, maybe want to talk about how I've addressed this text in, in the mm -hmm. past and not specifically video games uh, focus um, analysis because my um, thesis kind of, I devote a whole chapter to the idea of technological extension, which is from Andy Clark's book, Supersizing the Mind, and that deals with the, the idea of when the human body and technology meets and how technology can be part of the human body. Um, and I think that that's really central to black box as well. Um, and this idea of actually, um, is this an addition to the human body or is this part of the human experience? Is this part um, of the game experience as well? And maybe that's something mm. that becomes even more relevant when we would think about things like VR instead of just, you know, these console-based games. That's something that might become particularly more relevant, this concept of... Um, forgetting the barriers um, to connection with technology and actually seeing those procedures of technological activation as transparent. That's something that's uh, really central to both Andy Clark's ideas and also Catherine Hale's ideas of the post-human. Um, that's definitely something that's in my thesis as well, but I haven't particularly addressed the um, controller video game idea as much until now. Thank you very much. Um, next question. Uh, so I'm going to move so that Mary doesn't get bombarded because she was first. So I'm going to go to a question for David now. This is Ruth's question. Um, you mentioned the use of men who take on parenting roles in the ads. Do you see this as associating the games with a less traditional masculinity? Or is it an opportunity for those men to embrace a traditional heroic masculinity? Yeah, so... I, it's it's operating in both ways in a sense because the target demographic within that those new phase of ads which I didn't really get to talk about all that much are seems to be men who have already played video games and then are are now fathers and the ad is deliberately calling out to them and so in a couple of those ads we see a traditional or a stereotypical or however you want to describe it masculinity particularly in an ad where um, uh, the man's daughter is playing um, a game and she calls him and was like hey I, I finished this dungeon now where do I go next and then he kind of takes her through the steps of getting to the next area so you see uh, it, it's both that um, knowledgeable paternal figure but then you also see them positioning games as a way for men um, to connect to their children in also an interpersonal and kind of socio-emotional way. So I think I think it's doing a little bit of both in terms of that. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, right, so Anna, we're just going to pop over and see, I believe Demetra had a question for you. Uh, yeah. Um, so... Fascinating points regarding the community engagement taking place in relation to the devs of Malacca. Are there lessons larger, larger studios can take from this? And if so, can you speak to them? Oh, definitely. I think that for starters, uh, it's this idea that you can take a chance on something that you have not played with before. So maybe instead of a new God of War, or maybe along a new God of War. <laughs> you can also play with these other mythologies in this particular case or with these other cultures that haven't been exploited as they could be in a good way. So I think that would be the first one, so take a chance on them. And of course the engagement, for example, um, so when it comes to Assassin's Creed, the hiring of a consultant was a good step. Obviously the ideal scenario would be that the community itself works with the game. Although, for example, in this case, when I talked with the, some of the, the people who were working in the game, they said, like, of course, we are aware of that and we would love to see a game come from them. 
But we also knew that at this moment, there were not a lot of people in the community who knew enough about the, this medium to portray their story in a very accurate way or to really exploit it. So what they did is that they tried to forge paths ahead. To be like, I'm gonna come with you, I'm gonna hear you, I'm gonna do this, and maybe this will help other people to come after me and be the ones who actually develop these kind of stories. So when it comes to big studios, that also is a, a case for diversity in their hiring of their, their teams. So maybe you don't have a whole community that is interested in working with this, but there's someone out there in the writing room or the design department who wants to exploit that and is willing to do the legwork of going around and contacting them and then working to make sure that this is a good thing, that you make a good game. And also, uh, lastly, but not less important, uh, to you give, make sure you give back to the community. So maybe they don't want something from the profits. Maybe they don't need that. Maybe they think it might be insulting in a way. So you have to talk with them, be aware of what they would like to see out there. Maybe they want awareness on a certain topic. Maybe they're just okay with this good presentation. Or maybe they could use some of the profits or something else that you can do to make sure that you're not just coming over and taking, in a way, something from them and just using it for your own profit. I think those would be the, the big ones. Mm. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, we're going to go back to Mary. Um, this is a question from Ruth. Um, in the quotes you use from the game, there's a dichotomy in Egan's text. There are specific physical instructions, but at the same time, a use of poetic abstract language in talking about what the human is and can become. You may wish to talk about this in tandem with Ren's question, but how does this relate to the notion of the player body and the character body in this, in this game? game slash novel, I suppose. Yeah, um, I think so. Yeah, that does relate to the first question as well a bit. So maybe bring that in, in too. I think in both the the dual idea of language and also the idea of technology and the, the human body, in Egan's text, she's kind of pushing against this idea of um, digitization or the post-human as somehow anti-human, um, mm. which is you know, one, one line of thought in that it removes humanity, but instead bringing in this poetic language, which is also used in some parts of, you know, Haraway's text that is inherently political, feminist, it's not just a scientific manual. It brings back some of this humanity um, in how this is a um, not kind of an erasure of the human experience. But doubly in Egan's specific text here, it also echoes, I think, the dystopian um, aspect of the text. It is kind of an ironic commentary and a bit of a dystopian text. So this kind of ritual manifesto language plays a, a big role there as well, I think. Um, but between the player um, and the character, obviously the player is kind of my reading of it as well. It's not really a universal reading, but I think it is something that does help to pull out um, that kind of narrative that I'm overlaying. The, idea that um, they are not a programmed, I mean, they are a programmed machine, but this language that they are using makes them seem a bit more human, um, makes you see their humanity in them a bit more. I hope that answers some of your question. Thank you very much. Um, a question for David. Um, uh, this is from this is from Matt. Um, the chart that started off your presentation characterising stereotypical masculine and feminine behaviours seems troublingly ahistoric. For example, stoicism and logic are currently heavily contested notions in regards to gender and masculinity. Nowadays, scientific discourse positions boys as overall less emotionally and behaviourally regulated than girls. This is in connection with boys' statistically poor performance in school across all subject areas, including STEM disciplines. Can you clarify the scope within which you apply the notion of techno-masculinity and within which Nintendo's advertising applies it? That's a great question. I, I agree with you that the idea of those um, stereotypes sound antiquated, but I would also... I would also say that the very reason why the just, uh, uh, sorry the reason why the statistically poor performance in school in terms of emotional regulation and then also 
um, educational attainment for boys is such a concern is that it's deviating from that norm. Um, part of the reason why education is so concerned with it is because for so long it's been understood that the masculinity of men who do not agree or you know kind of confide with those standards are then deviating from that standard discursive discursive norm um so i would say that in general i mean of course it's antiquated like we don't want people to be to be subscribing to these things but also feminist discourse in general just kind of recognizes those um those ideas as still being relevant at least in some areas of, of society um and the reason why i kind of brought that in in terms of the game is because i saw that being very much played out within legend of zelda um in terms of in relation to the other ads um or the other games that were being shown within these ads um so i would i would say in terms of the techno masculinity aspect of it is that we're still seeing um the shift kind of these movements of what men and women play and how um, advertisers and game designers are kind of envisioning that on their end um, is starting to shift a little bit, right? It's in, it's in a, a movement. Um, but there's still some, even in Nintendo, which, I mean, I could talk about for a while about how it's being feminized by hardcore gamer discourse, but that's a whole nother thing. Um, even in Nintendo, right, there's still those areas where it's just men who are kind of dominating that domain and it's and in terms of techno masculinity it's the game that requires the longest amount of time the most skill in understanding the concepts behind playing the game um you know women are shown playing other sports or other or other esports or you know party games but the the game that's most about you know your traditional man who is kind of going out into an open world and taking over the environment um is still kind of regulated to being advertised to men um so it's not saying that women don't play the game or don't enjoy the game but rather that nintendo is kind of specifically still putting um this game into a area where it's appealing to men in particular Thank you very much, David. And finally, um, we have a question from Demetra for, um, for Anna. Um, I found the idea of having to construct a hero's journey, ju hero's journey out of disparate material really interesting and very similar to what happens in the Finnish um, Kalevara in the, 19, in the 19th century. I wonder, do we really need a hero's journey, which is a very Western... Uh, mythographic idea anyway oh I agree it's a very western thing to do to, to try to fit everything into this uh, discourse so I think that you can play with the the same concept or the same basis of the game in terms of culture with different kinds of games so for example you could have the same setting with maybe uh, more of an open world game and not actually have to follow this journey yeah, as part of an adventure uh, I think that in this particular case, they were working with this idea that they wanted the game to be accessible for a lot of people and to be appealing. So they knew that most of their potential market was already invested in this kind of games that follow the, the hero journey. And it also helped them to give structure because from the different myths, you have a lot of stories. So you could, you could have also worked with something more along the lines of, I don't know, like Telltale games and you have smaller narratives instead of just one big narrative. So I would be all in favor of non-Western ways of telling stories. And I think that a lot of innovation in terms of game mechanics or types of play can also work with this idea. And here in particular, I had another thought. Let me just get back to it. Oh gosh, I think it's gone. <laughs> but yeah, I agree. It's, it's a Western thing. And in this particular case, appealing to a Western audience is also part of the intention because then you would have these people uh, getting to know about another culture that they may have never encountered before. So it was part of like this, I'm not going to say like marketing ploy, but it was part of uh, a strategy. So hopefully in the future, we can also work with ways to integrate these non-Western ways of telling stories into massive markets. Oh, yeah, I remember that. 
the end of the game, the ending, although you do follow like uh, um, this structure, they made sure that the final resolution was very in line with their, uh, cos yeah, their cosmic vision of the world. So I'm not going to give spoilers, <laughs> but yes, they did, they did try to incorporate it, even if it wasn't in the structure itself. Yeah, I think that's a that, that that that's a great place to end it on the um the cut the 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 idea of um, bringing together disparate material to think about new digital heroes. I think that's a great place to end digital heroisms.